All right, so we're starting a little bit late, so I'm going to go a little bit extra fast. I want to emphasize a couple things. One of them is that these are my personal opinions, and my employer doesn't necessarily uh, endorse any of my personal opinions that might come up as I'm talking about these slides. Um, so just to test, I imagine most people here have heard of Google. How many people here have heard of Google Fiber? OK, quite a few. So we're an internet provider. This is the, the short version from PC Magazine. Uh, the bar on the left is the speed of Google Fiber, and the bars on the right are the speed of everybody else. Our bar is taller. Um, and so we, we spend a lot of time trying to make Wi-Fi go fast, because unlike almost everybody else's ISP these days, um, the WAN link is no longer the bottleneck. So we find that our bottlenecks start migrating everywhere except the WAN link, and Wi-Fi turns out to be one of our major bottlenecks. People get a gigabit connection at home and want to use wireless, of course, and find out that it's not a gigabit, and then they complain. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of stuff that we do to try to gather you know, information about exactly where the bottlenecks might be and under what situ situations, what might work and what might not work. When we're gathering this data, uh, I just want to you know, say on, you know, Again, in my own personal opinion, but based on the code that we spent all this time implementing, uh, we care a lot about anonymity. Um, and we, there's, there's sort of rumors out there that Google started the Google Fiber project to, so that we'd have even more access to your personal information so we could track you around the internet. And that, that's really actually not true. Uh, if you read our po privacy policy, the privacy rules for Google Fiber are in some ways even stricter than the privacy rules for the rest of Google. Uh, and some things that we do not track are which, which endpoints on the internet you're connecting to, uh, how frequently you connect to them, what their IP addresses are, what the content of it is. We don't do any deep packet inspecting and any of that stuff. Um, and so all of this information, obviously we make the Wi-Fi routers and that's, that's my team's project and the Wi-Fi router needs to know all these things, but that information never leaves the Wi-Fi router. And the information that does leave, because we do collect some statistics that I'm going to be showing you over the next few minutes, the information that we do collect tends to be anonymized and with all the really, the information we don't need for performance management removed. So specifically, we take out MAC addresses of stations, we take out the IP addresses of the machines you're talking to, uh, we definitely don't log session lengths or packet contents or anything like that. Uh, and then when people go to access it, it's even more anonymized. We sort of treat, treat the personal data, it's, it's sort of like um, radioactive. So the longer you're exposed to it, the worse that is. And the more you're exposed to, the worse that is. And if you're exposed to too much, then you die. Um, so we, we really spend a lot of time not trying to invade your privacy while we collect the following information. So what kind of information are we collecting about your Wi-Fi? Uh, the, here's, here's an example. If you've ever looked at a spectrum analyzer, this is an example of the Wi-Fi spectrum with some interference. We have a little program that we wrote. Um, you can see in the upper right, we have a uh, link to the, the open source versions of various tools that we're making. So the tool we wrote to collect um, spectrum analysis data from your Wi-Fi link is, is linked here. And the output sort of looks like it does in this slide. The main thing that you can see is like the y-axis. Uh, there's one per line, one which is one per 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi channel, and then the percent of time that was spent in each of the different uh, signal level buckets is shown across the uh, horizontal side. So in this case, it was a t period of low Wi-Fi traffic. So in almost all cases, it was the minimum power level bucket that was that was shown. But if we had interference coming from various different kinds of sources, even non-Wi-Fi traffic, we should be able to see it on the spectrum analysis chart. And our devices sort of jump off channel every now and then to see what, um, what is going on on the other channels so they can try to make an informed decision about what channel to be on and what might be going wrong. So we try to do a little bit better than just counting the number of access points in, in, in a region to try to pick a channel. Um, but we gather some other stuff as well. So here's a really basic bit of information. It's a histogram of the number of uh, visible access points uh, near basically every Google Fiber customer's Wi-Fi router. Uh, and so you can see there's a few interesting things in this histogram. One of them is that zero has a, has a pretty large number of samples. Uh, and that's not that surprising because some of our customers actually turn off their Wi-Fi. Um, one actually has a very small number of samples because basically our Wi-Fi router shows up as two different radios because it's got 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, so it's very unlikely you'll have a single radio visible. And then there's 
two access points for the people who are lucky enough to live in isolation. Um, and then from there, you have you know, not very many Wi-Fi radios around the you know, 5 to 10 range that's very popular. And it, it goes down, and it goes down to you know, the long tail is very, very long. So in my microscopic little uh, x-axis there, the number on the far right is 100. Uh, and there, there are still people with 100 access points within range. Not very many of them, but, but they're out there, right? And these are the people who probably have worse performance than some of the other people. Um, here's another really interesting chart uh, that I think maybe nobody else in the world has. Um, this is basically just the number of, or the fraction of devices there are of each type currently in the field. Uh, client stations. So that tall bar in the middle is one by one 802.11n devices, which are your typical low-end phone. Uh, the one to its left, because my x-axis is sorted alphabetically, is one by one 802.11ac. Um, that, that's obviously faster than n, but it, there's a lot fewer of them. And then one by one, thankfully, one by one 802.11abg devices are a very small bar. So there's not very many of those left. I think, well, um, right, A is technically not represented there because uh, 5 gigahertz is the red bar, so there is no red in the 1 by 1 802 n devices, or G rather. Uh, Nest thermostats, I believe, are some of the, or are maybe a large number of the things in that bar. Um, and then there's quite a few 2 by 2 devices. You see almost all of them end up supporting 5 gigahertz. Um, well, sorry, the AC, 802 11 AC devices also, almost all support 5 gigahertz, although there's some interesting ones that are. Technically, 802.11ac chipsets, they support the new MCS levels, but they didn't bother putting in a uh, 5 gigahertz uh, RF transceiver, which is what the small little sliver of blue at the bottom is. And then 2x2, two two, there's quite a few. If you're wondering how many people have 3x3 three three devices, that's the teeny tiny little bar on the right. Uh, so if you're buying a 3x3 three three or a 4x4 four four Wi-Fi router, you should be aware that there's limited benefit you're getting from, from this Wi-Fi router, unless you have one of those very few devices, which are almost entirely MacBook Pros. And uh, we actually don't have any, we've never observed an 802.11n 3x3 device. Uh, so I'm not sure if, I mean, I imagine they must exist in labs somewhere, but they don't seem to exist in actual people's computers in their homes. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so here's, here's another graph. This one I included partly just because it looks cool. Uh, but these are, we have TV boxes that we distribute. Uh, for our TV service, and they all contain wireless chips as well. And so they can actually see what the signal strength is as observed on the TV box of the original or the central access point in the home. And so red is again 5 gigahertz, and, two, and um, blue is, sorry, did I get it backwards? Uh -huh. Right. On this chart, red is 2.4 gigahertz, and blue is 5 gigahertz. And the uh, observed RSSI is on the y-axis, and I've just sorted the TV boxes. So each, each horizontal position is one TV box. And I've sorted them by the maximum RSSI they ever observed. And the, the funny little curve uh, that's sort of up and to the left is just an artifact of my weird sorting algorithm. So you should, you should ignore that. But the, the interesting thing is that the generally at high signal, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz are pretty similar. And you can see the modest but does exist effect of 5 gigahertz decaying a little bit faster with, uh, with distance and with, um, with, as it goes through walls. As, so, so you see the 2.4 doesn't go down as fast as the 5 gigahertz does. And then toward the end, you can see it drops off a lot more quickly. Um, we can also, we have, two, we have uh, multiple different variants of our access point hardware. So we can actually see using this information uh, the relative signal strength, we basically measure the RSSI of all the stations attached to each of these devices across the entire fleet. And so we can show when we make minor hardware changes whether there is an improvement or a, a, a reduction in overall signal strength. Uh, and so the red line in this case, this is a cumulative distribution function with RSSI on the x-axis. And so to the right is better. And so the red router has slightly higher signal strength. And it turns out in this case, it's 3 dB higher signal strength for a reason that turned out to have some sort of hardware explanation. Um, OK, so that's sort of passive, passively generated measurements, but we also do active measurements. One of the things we do in our, our Google Fiber Android TV app has a little background task that runs. It wakes up once a day and runs this little test for 30 seconds or so, uh, which I'm sure will 
will make the, the Android people angry that we woke up their machine in the middle of the night to waste battery for 30 seconds, but we do. Um, and ISOPing is a program that I wrote that can measure the transmitted receive latencies separately. Um, and the source code link is up there if you want to see how it works. Uh, so you might notice in this graph in particular, we're sort of mapping the transmit latency and the receive latency on, like, on the x-axis and y-axis re respectively. Uh, the latency drops below zero uh, in some of the measurements, uh, and you can see that there's sort of a y equals minus x line uh, and that does drop below zero. The reason for that is that the people who took my ISO ping program and translated it to Java made a little mistake uh, in one of the uh, packet counting code, which we did fix eventually, but there's still a bunch of people running the old version of the code. So we have a situation where basically we can accidentally exchange 100 milliseconds of transmit latency for minus 100 milliseconds of receive latency or vice versa. Uh, so I didn't try to fix that, but the, the interesting part is the part where that didn't really happen, which thankfully is generally under 100 milliseconds, so I zoomed in on that. Um, and so we can see that you know typical latencies in our Wi-Fi, uh, if you <clears throat> if you looked at uh, Tim Shepard's presentation earlier today, we're talking about Wi-Fi latencies. Um, so typical latencies are actually quite low, but they can be up to around 15 milliseconds is where the, the cluster sort of lies. And then beyond that, things can be all over the place. And quite often, the receive latency is very different from the transmit latency um, as you get. So you can see that often transmit and receive latencies go up approximately the same, like y equals x, but there's also these samples all over the place, which makes sense because you would expect that either one direction or the other is probably clogged while the other one is probably not uh, when things are getting really clogged. And so these speckles that are way off, you know, way above 15 milliseconds are the ones we would like to eliminate eventually. Um, here is, okay, so Wi-Fi Blaster is another program that we wrote. This one I'm actually pretty proud of. Um, the name sounds a little bit ominous, but it's, uh, it basically it blasts packets out the Wi-Fi interface as fast as they will go. And internally, our code name for this was the Gattaca test. I don't know how many people here saw the movie. Uh, but the, the, the tagline is, uh, he never saved anything for the way back. And so the Gattaca test only blasts all the packets as hard as it can, but it doesn't expect any answers back from these packets. It just takes advantage of the fact that with Wi-Fi, every packet that you manage to get through does get an acknowledgement bit in a batch acknowledgement that comes back eventually. So you actually know, unlike with a wired link, how many packets were actually received by the chipset at the other end. And you don't care if the kernel got it necessarily, all you care about is whether the Wi-Fi chipset got it. Uh, which we found, interestingly, in many cases, uh, a lot of these Wi-Fi, low power Wi-Fi devices won't even bother waking up the host CPU. Uh, they just acknowledge the packet, say like, I don't know, even, even know what this packet is, it's not even a valid IP packet, and throw it away without even using any battery on the host CPU. So our access points now all generate these, these Gattaca test packets on a regular basis. Um, and this is a really simple plot. This is, um, the blue line is 2.4 gigahertz, the red line is 5 gigahertz, and you can see the 2.4 gigahertz obviously maxes out at a particular low, relatively low speed. Um, and that five gigahertz is going up to considerably higher speed. I didn't even go to get to 100%, but if you go up to 700 or 800 megabits, there's a few people getting those sorts of speeds. But as you can see, the vast majority of people get much below the maximum possible Wi-Fi speed. Um, here's another interesting statistic. We have our customers divided up into what's called single family units and multi-dwelling units. Uh, multi-dwelling units are like apartment buildings and single family units are um, homes or you know, standalone houses. Uh, so this plot, what it means is that MDUs, which is the red line, get slightly better average performance than single family units, which is actually kind of counterintuitive. I, if you had asked me to make a guess, I would have said it would be the other way around, because in a multi-dwelling unit, it's a lot more crowded, so you'd expect there to be a lot more um, activity on the, on the airwaves interfering with you. Uh, but it turns out that that is overwhelmed by this chart, which is the signal strength in a single family versus multi-dwelling unit. In multi-dwelling units, because they're smaller, it means you're usually closer to the access point. And so you have several dB more signal strength, and so you end up having, uh, you end up having faster speeds because you're going at a, uh, you have a higher signal. And this is a plot of what happens, actually. Uh, we have lots and lots of data, so we can produce a chart like this, which is RSSI, or signal strength, on the x-axis, and megabits achieved on the y-axis. 
Uh, I know Wi-Fi hardware vendors like to like to produce charts like this in a lab, and they call it the rate over range chart. Well, this is the real world rate over range chart. It doesn't quite look like it does when you do it in the lab. Um, and you can see that single family units, interestingly, are getting less speed at any given signal strength than uh, multi-dwelling units. I actually don't know why that is, uh, but it seems very consistent across thousands and thousands of homes. Uh, so there's, there's some reason for that. I personally would have thought background interference would mean that at a given signal strength, you should get lower speeds. Uh, here is a more detailed version of the same plot uh, with basically this is basically one dot for every sample that we, we gathered across the entire fleet over the course of a day. Uh, so you can see there's a couple of interesting things there, but generally the blue dots are lower. Those are 2.4 gigahertz, and there's a few little light red dots way up, way up high for the number of people getting high speeds, but generally you don't get very high speeds. Um, I also have a plot for how much does performance drop when you have more stations connected to an access point. And this is, remember, in residential settings, so basically the number of stations connected, they're almost all idle almost all the time. But you do get a statistically significant drop uh, as the number of people connected to your access point drops. You get something like a roughly 20 to 30% difference as you get into like 10 stations. Uh, and that's probably just because it increases the probability that somebody else is downloading at the same time as you. Uh, another new feature we've recently added I call Wi-Fi taxonomy, uh, which basically allows us to, people like to call this sort of thing fingerprinting, but Google is very sensitive about the word fingerprinting because we're often accused of fingerprinting people. Uh, Wi-Fi taxonomy does not uniquely identify a person, it uniquely identifies a type of device. And so there's only you know, roughly a thousand different types of devices in the whole Google Fiber customer fleet. Uh, and we've sort of identified about 60% of them, but we can uniquely distinguish about 1,000 different uh, device types. And so once you start breaking things down by device type, you can do neat stuff like this. So here is the same dot plot as before, only filtered down to a particular model of a particular type of phone. Uh, and you can see the, the red line and the blue line are the averages for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, respectively. Uh, and you can see that. Uh, first of all, there are not very many data points in the greater than 30 or so, D, minus 30 or so dB of signal. And so the little gray bars around it sort of expand out and that means that the, the certainty of the average is not very precise because there's not very many points there. But it looks about as much, about like you would expect. Uh, at low signal strength, the speed drops. Eventually it sort of peaks and it doesn't get any better because your signal strength is good enough that that's as fast as the can be delivered and then it stays flat. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, an interesting uh, anomaly is if you look, pull out Chromecasts instead, first of all, we have a lot more data points at much higher signal strength, and secondly, the line curves downwards as you go, um, as you go towards the, the far right. And we call this the, the screaming in your ear effect, uh, where basically Wi-Fi desensitizes when the signal is too high. And why does Chromecast have signals that are much higher than your phone? It's because very often people have a cabinet and they will put their access point and their Chromecast like literally right next to each other, which is actually too loud. The Chromecast would work better if it were further away than if, if it was that close. Um, and a couple of years ago, I saw a presentation about Minstrel Blues, which we're going to be testing sometime soon. And that will auto-decrease the transmit power um, based on performance. So if we do that, we should be able to make this downward curve flatten out. And that's one of the things our access points will hopefully be able to do better than typical access points, and we'll try to get that. Uh, well, I'll be able to report back on whether that works when we run the experiment. Right. So yeah, it might need some work. Uh, the comment was that sometimes or the code currently assumes that won't happen. but uh, but. We'll, we should be able to make it assume that it will happen and, and actually fix this sort of problem because it's actually surprisingly common. You can see there's quite a few dots in this low, reduced signal area. Um, another problem I'll just skim over, but one of the things we discovered is in fact uh, the common advice on 2.4 gigahertz to just use channels 1, 6, and 11 turns out not to always be the best advice. We have an actual data set from a very high density Wi-Fi environment where things were fixed by by actually using partially overlapping channels on purpose. Um, and the reason for that is interesting. The reason is that you c if you are doing interference detection or, or co-channel interference detection with Wi-Fi, if you can decode the packet, you consider that someone else to be talking. 
If you can't decode it, you only consider someone else to be talking if the RSSI is greater than like minus 62 or so. So there's this magic region between about minus 62 and minus 90 dB where devices will decide to top, stop talking when their next door neighbor is talking even though they don't really care what the next door neighbor is saying. And in these super high density environments, you can actually improve performance by going slightly off channel so you can't detect or can't decode the other person's packet. Uh, anyway, this diagram tries to explain that. And this diagram tries to show when we break it down by customer groups, we pulled out this one apartment building, that's the green line and we changed the channel selection algorithm um, and it jumped from way below average to not as far below average after making this change. They were still kind of below average because uh, it's a super high density environment and there's lots of interference. Uh, here is, let's see, I'm getting very short on time, but here is a uh, plot of, based on my formula for how fast your Wi-Fi should go, the actual Wi-Fi speeds that were achieved. So the x-axis is what I think you should have been able to do with your device using Wi-Fi taxonomy, and the y-axis is what you actually got. And each, each tiny little dot is a sample of a device uh, doing a performance test. And you can see that in general, for the most part, devices don't do better than my formula says they should have been able to, with the exception of some devices at the low end where obviously I've miscalculated what that device should have been able to do. But for the most part, the darkest areas are just below the green line. Um, but it's, and so I sort of consider this graph to be the, if our Wi-Fi was perfect, all of those dots would be really close to the green line. So obviously our, the implementation of Wi-Fi in all of these different drivers is not perfect right now, but the closer we can get to perfect, the better we would be. And we can break down this graph by taxonomy and say like, iPhones seem to do better or worse in such and such situation. Here's another one where instead of using what I predicted would happen, I broke each device down by taxonomy found the average speed for that device, put that on the x-axis, and then plotted the actual sample achieved for each device on the y-axis. And you can see this one maps a lot better. So Avery's calculation for what should be possible is not that good, but statistics can be really useful when determining what, what you actually should expect. And we're using this, or we're going to use this for our customer support. When they phone in and say, how come I'm not getting gigabit Wi-Fi, we can say, well, you're not supposed to get a gigabit Wi-Fi because that's impossible, but given the type of device that you have and the signal strength that you're getting, you should expect a signal strength be or a, a transmit rate between such and such and such and such. Uh, and that, we're hoping, will help reduce the argument, uh, arguments people have on the phone uh, about what should and should not be possible. Um, and one more thing, we have a, we have a patch uh, called band steering that will try to tells host APD how to bounce people between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. It's a pre relatively simple patch that we're hoping to upstream sometime soon, and this is a plot of how much better performance gets when you turn on this band steering feature. As far as I know, it doesn't hurt anything. We filtered out Apple devices because they tend to choose the right thing on their own. Uh, but for other sorts of devices, there's a significant improvement in performance uh, by turning on this patch. Uh, I have another thing, but one of the problems with all of these tests is if your Wi-Fi is too terrible, people stop using it, uh, especially when they have phones. They will just turn off their Wi-Fi and use uh, 3G or LTE on their phones. Uh, and so trying to determine when things are broken is a separate issue that has a lot of things that we can discuss. But one of the things that I've noticed is uh, if devices are constantly trying to bounce back and forth between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, that means they're upset about something. And so it's usually an indicator that something has gone wrong. Um, I won't even talk about this slide, but we want to measure latency as well as bandwidth, and I think we found a way to do that in a passive way that won't actually require uh, messing around with uh, like sending out packets on a regular basis and killing people's batteries. And yeah, our time fairness is another one. So we don't have time for questions, I don't think, do we? Yeah. No questions? Okay. Good. So. Thank you.